Are we ever going to get back to neural networks? Although most of you probably don't watch these videos in sequence. But I've been promising that I'll get back to neural networks. But then I keep going down these rabbit holes. And then rabbit holes for the rabbit holes. It's like the inception of rabbit holes. What I was going to do this week was do a Monte Carlo comparing my new metrics that I've invented with existing metrics and see how well they perform. But problem. I don't know how many of you actually know what a Monte Carlo simulation is. So rather than giving a piss poor introduction to Monte Carlo's in the video that will be short, I'm going to do a dedicated video to what Monte Carlo simulations are. So if you have ever wondered how to Monte Carlo your way through life, this is the video, people. So let's say you are trying to get into shape. You're trying to lose weight. But you also want to hit your protein goals so you're not losing muscle while you're losing weight. But the problem is um, you've tried the calorie counting thing before and it really sucks. I did it for like a year straight and it was awful. And every time I try to do it again, I'm like, yeah, I hate this. So if you're like me, you just kind of eat what feels right and try to kind of be aware of how many calories you consume. But maybe you decide, can I use statistics to help me out? By golly, you can. So let's set up the problem. I call this the pizza and protein problem. The pizza and protein planning problem. Alliteration intended. So let's say you eat three meals a day. And for breakfast, you choose one of the three meals, either a smoothie, waffles, or eggs. And you just estimate that 85% of the time you choose smoothies, 10% of the time you choose waffles, 5% of the time you choose eggs. And maybe for lunch and dinner, you always eat the same three or four meals. And maybe they look like this. So either a burrito, chicken, deep fried chicken strips, mm, or roast beef and sweet potatoes. And so you choose from one of those four options for lunch and for dinner. And you choose with the probabilities presented in the table. So 30% of the time you choose protein, 30% chicken and rice, 10% chicken strips, and 30% roast beef and sweet potato. And let's say that you, like me, try to avoid pizza because it is so delicious. I cannot stop myself from eating pizza. So the best strategy is to avoid it. But occasionally, I like to have a movie night with my kids where we eat pizza and pig out. But I only have it every couple of weeks. Or another way to put it is about 2% of the time for dinner, I have pizza. And when I eat pizza, I don't just eat like one or two slices. I eat an embarrassing amount. So let's just say that for dinner, there's a 2% chance that I'm going to eat pizza and I'm going to eat 3000 calories, which gives me 120 grams of protein. And then let's say I get the late night munchies and I'm feeling the need for something sweet. True story. And so 15% of the time I get a sweet tooth at night. And so I choose between one of these three options. Sugar-free jello, low calorie ice cream, or Biscoff and carrots. Have you ever had the, the peanut butter like Biscoff? Okay, I don't like Biscoff cookies all that much, but the Biscoff butter, ah! Oh! It's so amazing. And with carrots, it makes you feel healthy when it's not. So those are my dessert options. And so my goal is to stay between 2,000 and 2,200 calories and to have over 130 grams of protein. So what I want to know is if I use this strategy, what's the probability I'd be under my calorie limit? And what's the probability I'd hit my protein goals? And what is the probability of doing both of those? Now you could try to solve it mathematically. And some aspects of this might be easy to calculate mathematically. So I'm going to just show you some math and don't worry about understanding it, but you can compute expected values. So for breakfast, if 85% of the time I am drinking a smoothie, 10% of the time I'm having waffles and 5% of the time I'm having eggs, the expected number of calories is equal to the probability of smoothie times the calories in a smoothie plus the probability of waffles times the calories of waffles plus the probability of eggs times the probability of eggs, which is 395. And I could do the same for protein. I could do the same for lunch and for dinner. And then I could also do the same thing for pizza and for dessert. And so if we just sum all those up together, this is the expected value of calories and expected value of protein. Or in other words, I am certainly under my calorie limit, but also under my protein goal. Now, that was just the mean. What if you want to know variability? 
Or let's say we throw in some dependencies. Let's say that if your lunch is over 800 calories, there's a 25% chance you skip dinner. Or maybe the probability of choosing the lower calorie option is much higher than the probability of choosing the higher calorie option. Or maybe another dependency might be if you eat dessert one day, you're less likely to eat breakfast the next day. Or maybe there's a truncation rule that if you get to 2,400 calories, you just stop eating. Even if you hit that limit before the end of the day. So once we start adding in those weird contingencies, the math just doesn't work out anymore. We can assume independence, which the math requires us to assume independence. And you also can't break it cleanly into neat expected values. And you still can't compute variability. So the math becomes unreasonably complicated very, very fast. So Monte Carlos are one way to very quickly and simply estimate very complex mathematical problems. So let me give you a history. So Monte Carlo simulations, um, kind of weird, were invented in the 1940s during the Manhattan Project. For those of you who don't know, the Manhattan Project was the United States effort to produce a nuclear bomb. So Monte Carlo was born from atomic weapon research. And so Stanislaw Ulam was recovering from an illness and he was playing solitary. And then he started to wonder, what's the probability of winning given a specific hand? Now that's a really, really complicated mathematical problem to work out, to consider all possible combinations of hands you could be dealt in solitaire and the probability of winning them. That's just like impossible to calculate. So what Ulam decided to do was just play a bunch of games of solitaire and then record his results. He didn't math it, he just computed it directly. And later John von Neumann, who was part of the Manhattan Project, formalized the approach and he called it Monte Carlo, named after Monte Carlo, Morocco, which is famous for its casinos. Now, why was he linking that to casinos? Well, if you think about a simulation, what you're doing is you're using random numbers to generate various conditions. And when you roll a dice, you're relying on random numbers. So the link makes sense. And it's cool. Monte Carlo. When people ask me what I do for a living, I say I run Monte Carlo simulations. How about you? Sometimes they're Markov chains, sometimes they're not. So now back to our calorie problem. So instead of trying to compute the math of that, why not just define probabilities and decision rules? And let's say we just generate a thousand days according to these rules of probability. And then we can tally the number of calories and then the amount of protein consumed in a day. And then if we use some simple mathematics, we could even track our estimated weight over time. So let me step into R real quick and show you what that might look like. So here I have a table of breakfast. And so I have wrapped this in a function. So each time I iterate through this function, I'm going to ask it to randomly sample one of those rows according to the probability. And so for this specific day that I'm simulating, wow, I got a rare event. I got waffles. Yay, I love waffles. And so for breakfast on this simulated day, I have waffles. And just to show you that it's non-deterministic, or in other words, it's going to change every time, see what's happening. Most of the time, it's choosing smoothie because it has an 85% probability. But if I do it enough times, occasionally I'm going to get waffles. And then I could do the same thing for lunch. So here's my lunch metrics with their probabilities, their calories, and their protein intake. And then for this simulated day of lunch, I get roast beef. So I have now consumed two meals in my fake world. This is like Dungeons and Dragons, basically. Monte Carlos are like Dungeons and Dragons without the cool storytelling. All right, now we go to dinner and I'm going to add this rule that says I have a 15% chance of skipping dinner if lunch is greater than 600 calories. And what happens today? I do not skip dinner. But I also have this other contingency that there's a 2% chance that I'm going to get pizza. Let's see what ended up happening. Okay, today's a boring day. I'm having chicken and rice. And then of course, I've got my dessert data, which shows my three options, their probabilities, their calories, and their protein. And so let's see what happens today in our simulated world. I do not have dessert, which makes sense because I only have a 15% chance of selecting dessert in this Monte Carlo simulation. And then what we could do is we could just take what we actually ate for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert, add up the calories, add up the protein, and then return that information. And so now I'm going to simulate 100 days of eating like that. And let's say my starting weight is 180. And no, that is not my starting weight. And no, I will not tell you. Okay, it's uh, 205. I'm a big dude. 
And then here is where the actual Monte Carlo happens. So replicate means do the following n times. And in this case, I'm saying n equals 100. And so I'm simulating what might happen if I did this over 100 days. And then all this magic right here, all it's doing is it's tracking my weight over time, assuming these values. And that's what the data set looks like. It just shows you how much calories I had on a particular day with the number of grams of protein. And then my weight with my maintenance calories and then my calorie difference and then the cumulative calorie difference and then the weight change over time. And then I can plot this in Flexplot. And that's what we get. So it looks like we were steadily losing weight and then probably that's when we had pizza. We jumped up and then we started losing weight again. And every once in a while we have a jump up because we had that pizza. But it looks like we are losing weight based on this simple Monte Carlo simulation. Now that was one track of 100 days. I could do that same track 10,000 times and then ask the Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, on average, if I do this for 100 days, 10,000 times on average, how much weight do I lose? And I might also be interested in how often I hit both my calorie and my protein goal. And it looks like 24% of the time, which means I'm probably not eating enough protein. So even though I'm losing weight, I'm not hitting my protein goals. Do you see how easy that was? I mean, barring the whole having enough R skills to do that. Like the fact that I didn't have to compute anything. I just let the computer simulate all these different conditions for me. That's amazing. So there are certain problems that math just can't handle. And in those situations, we use Monte Carlo simulations. So when we did that Monte Carlo, it wasn't guessing. It is sampling from a simulation that is realistic to what actually happens. Now, in all honesty, one thing that occurred to me is if I have waffles one day, there's a higher probability I'm going to have waffles the next day because I make a compote and it's delicious and I don't want it to go bad. So I might eat waffles two days in a row and I could simulate that. I could say if there were waffles on this day, the probability of having waffles the next day jumps to 90%. And the cool thing about this is you don't have to be math savvy. And that's what's cool about this is you could change the conditions and then run it again and see what happens. And let's just say that the trajectory showed that I would actually gain weight after 100 days. Well, then I could start fiddling with the conditions. I could start adding lower calorie meals and telling myself, all right, I have to eat this lower calorie meal at least 50% of the time or something like that. And I could simulate what would happen. Very cool, very easy way to figure out answers to questions. And Monte Carlos are used a lot in statistics research. And it's almost a guarantee that if you create a new statistical method that you're going to have to provide evidence that it works and your evidence is either going to be mathematical evidence or it's going to be a Monte Carlo simulation. And so let me give you an example of how that might look. Now in this example, I'm not actually inventing anything new, but instead I'm asking, okay, what happens if I have very abnormal data and want to run a t-test? Does the difference between means tend to be the same as if it were a normal distribution? And how about the variability? How does skewness affect variability? So here I have a function that takes two arguments, the sample size and the function that I use to create the data. So you'll see down here that I simulated normal and here I simulate an exponential. And in each case, I simulated distribution for group one, then one for group two, and then I do a t-test and then report the standard error and the mean difference. So that is the function that I am iterating. And this right here is the Monte Carlo. So I am performing that function 10,000 times and as an argument, I am giving it a normal distribution and then I'm binding the rows together. And if I do that and then compute the means, I get a standard error of 0.2569 and a mean difference of negative 0.003. Of course they should be zero because I simulated them to have the mean because the default here is gonna be zero. Now, let's see what happens when we do that with a random exponential distribution. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, if I go, hist r e x p and i'll do a thousand then we get a severely skewed distribution so this ain't no small skewness people so if i perform the same simulation but this time with skewed values i get a very similar standard error 0.25 and a very similar mean difference cool so apparently normality doesn't make a difference when you're talking about a t-test which may be news to some of you it's not to me because i know stuff so back to the topic of last week, I invented new, or I think I invented, again, somebody else might've invented it already, 
If so, then I independently invented new Shep values. And like I said in the last video, I'm very, very wary of being presumptuous enough to believe that this rando YouTuber invented something that performs better than the existing method. So one way to evaluate that is with a Monte Carlo simulation, which is what I'm gonna show you next week. But just to wrap up, Monte Carlo methods are amazing. They take really, really complex mathematical problems and they turn it into an algorithm that is fairly easy to perform that gives you very precise answers. And in that situation, you don't need math, you don't need calculus. You just need code that mimics the world that you're studying. So stay tuned for next week when I actually show you the Monte Carlo that I wrote. And by the way, starting very soon by the time I publish this video, just a couple days from the publishment, publishment, publish statusness of this video, I am going to be teaching a mixed models class. So if you want to learn about mixed models, be sure to visit the link in the description. And you know what? I'm going to offer 15% off. Coupon code is in the description. And of course, if that doesn't work for you, you could always do the self-guided class. And why not? That code can be used for the self-guided mixed models class. And if you're not interested in either of those, feel free to check out all the classes that I offer and see if one will suit your fancy. All right, friends, it's been a pleasure. I hope you have enjoyed this discussion of Monte Carlo simulations and I'll see you next time. Peace out. Yeah, you need to actually think about what kind of model you're fitting. Uh, but that far from the truth. But you know what? Us nerds gotta do anything we can to develop some street cred, as they say. It is the best approach for me to use, but you're going to reject my paper because you don't understand it. Well, pick up a book! As if it's an affront to your dignity that I used a procedure you don't know. Are you so threatened in your fragile ego that if I say a word that you don't know, that you can't look it up? Did Einstein use a stupid t-test to prove relativity? I didn't think so. What? We're talking about Monte Carlos. We're talking about Monte Carlos. Odyssey. I am the Odysseus of Data. Did he go on a quest for the lovely Guinevere? I am not Quantsyke no more. I am Simplistix. Parentheses, Quantsyke. Hmm. That parentheses is important. Mm -hmm. uh, no, not really. Maybe you're just having trouble following one who speaks with proper grammar. You ever thought about that? Hmm? Of times past, of times pearls. You know, I used to watch The Office and I always thought, man, Andy is a terrible singer. Cause he would always do this like, <laughs> but then like his final episode when you're saying goodbye to the cast. Oh, I will remember you. I will remember you. And man, he sounded good. I was like, oh, when he's not being silly, he's actually got a great voice. So don't destroy your vocals with silliness, unless you're Jack Black, in which case your in which case your silliness merely enhances the vocal quality of your timbre. The vocal timbre of your quality. The vocal timbre and vocal quality. There we are. Finish! <laughs>